There's no doubt that our world and the people in it are wounded by the effects of sin and they are in need of healing. This is why Pope Francis said last year that he sees the church as a field hospital after battle. We'll talk about that with our guest tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pack and welcome to EWTN Live, which is our opportunity to bring you guests from all over the world. Before we get to, the, to tonight's guest, uh, today the church is celebrating the feast of St. Robert Bellarmine of the Society of Jesus. He uh, entered in 1560 and remained, uh, he stayed alive to 1621. Uh, 79 years old. He eventually, well, of course, he was a great scholar, but also was made a cardinal, and then after being cardinal, was made a bishop, and he was a great writer of catechisms and is, in fact, the patron saint of catechists. So this is a great saint for us to celebrate. You can see the picture. He's uh, laid out in death. You can, if you're ever in Rome and go to the San Ignacio, St. Ignatius Church, uh, he's in a, a coffin there. All right, uh, we want to get to our guest tonight. Uh, he is Nigerian-born Catholic priest and journalist. He did a TV series with us on EWTN called The Faith with Father Morris. And he was very well received. So he's written a new book called Word for a Wounded World, which has recently been, recently been made into a special EWTN television series shot on location in Africa. They were, they were filming in Nigeria and Cameroon. So really, EWTN is everywhere, and we do bring you guests from all over the world. Here to tell us more about it, please welcome the host of Word for Wounded World, premiering this month on EWTN, Father Maurice Emelu. Father Maurice, you, good to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be back once again. Very, it's very nice to have you back here at EWTN. It's, it's, um, it, it, you've been uh, doing the show before, that's where we met, and also um, you read your book. Uh, when it was in pre-publication form. When, this is an interesting topic. You know, the, a word for a wounded world. First of all, why did you go film that series back at your home uh, country of Nigeria in the neighbor Cameroon? Yeah, well, thank you, Father Mitch, for once again this wonderful opportunity to share with you and uh, to share with the world mm -hmm. what I feel that is very, very needed today. Mm -hmm. um, I remember last year um, we felt the need to go to Africa mm -hmm. because so many things were happening in the world, you know, news of uh, terrorism, violence, and bad blood in the polity not just in Africa, but elsewhere. That's for sure. Many people were feeling wounded, were hurting. And I felt that a perspective delivered right close to where it's happening and using it as a kind of a, um, a reflection to show to the world the voice of hope and healing in this wounded world, healing for a wounded heart. So that was the first impetus for the journey to Africa. The second impetus for the journey to Africa is as an African, 
I felt that I needed to uh, be with my brothers and sisters as well mm -hmm. to show the, the challenges and opportunities, the hopes and pains of the African church. And the only way I can tell that story will be to be in the field, where, right there, where it's happening. And I believe that there will be an interchange, an exchange of, of experiences that will enhance the production as well, far well, more than the studio. Well, see, one of the, th I, I, I think that that's right, and that also would get at the tone of your book. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. you, you liked the comment that I made because I did. you bring, uh, what I noticed is how you bring the wisdom of the fathers of the church, the great theologians, but also interweave it with the wisdom of Africa. You include proverbs and experiences from Africa, and it's interwoven, uh, not rejecting the uh, tradition of the church, mm -hmm. not rejecting Africa, but seeing they help each other come alive. That was one of the very strong elements. And so going to Africa to, to do this filming makes great sense. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I I if you saw some of the clips, you know, you will see that blend. You will see that um, f flavor that is coming from this continent. You will see that enthusiasm that is unique to the continent. You see the hope, you see the faith that has come alive in spite of all these great challenges we are facing today. Yeah. I, I wanted to tell that story. And as a journalist, I felt you cannot tell the story all alone. Pictures speak louder than many words. Mm -hmm. Just having camera on people, see the joy they, 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 they show, looking at their countenance, for me would tell a lot of story more than I could write in the book. As a matter of fact, we've got some video clips from this series, Hope for a Wounded World, and I'd like to show this. Let's take a look so people can see what you're talking about. Let's go to those clips. The one in whom we trust is the one who created the heavens and the earth out of nothing. So long as we look up to Jesus, we are pulled from the despondency of this life into the hope that transforms. But when we take our gaze off from Jesus, we begin to sink in the storm of despair. The looking up is hope. The looking down is, is despair. Hope in Him, Israel, hope in the Lord. Bambenda people, hope in the Lord. Everybody wants to fall in love. And if you must fall in love, fall in love with God. He gave them a new commandment and he said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another as I love you. After all, our life is more important than our having. Life is more important than acquisition. Life is more important than skyscrapers. Life is good because God is good. God love you. God bless you. realities that this brings out, which is typically ignored, as we were talking earlier, 
uh, by the secular media in the West is that Christianity has now become the primary religion of Africa. Rightly said. And as we are talking, each day more people are converted from Islam into Christianity right in Africa. The mainstream media wouldn't want to talk about it. No, no. The Islamic communities would not want to talk about it. But we do know that more people are converted because they find a peace they long for in Christianity. They find moral excellence they don't find in the Quran. They find the gospel, look at the Beatitudes. Look at, look at the, the excellent model that our Lord presents. And sometimes they ask, how can you kill my brother? We are all members of Islam and you kill my brother in the name of one ideological um, mindset. Mm -hmm. And you want me to trust you. And here is the thing. I, and you're referring here to groups like Boko Haram. Like Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda. You know, Boko Haram operating in Nigeria, especially in one state in Nigeria, Bonu State in Nigeria. It's up in the north. It's northeast of Nigeria. So, and Nigeria is a large country, mm -hmm. and predominantly people fro that are members of this Boko Haram, greater percentage of them are from just one tribe of Nigeria, the, uh, not tribe, one ethnic group of Nigeria called the Kanuri ethnic group. And this ethnic group has only um, members in one state in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So think of this large con country of 180 million people and a few people are causing more harm than good. We have more than 250 ethnic groups in Nigeria, and see, they are just one. See, and this is one of the things a lot so, of Westerners think, well, it's Nigeria, you're all the same, right? No, Nigeria a is a very great diversity yeah. of different languages and, and different ethnic communities. More than 500 languages, <laughs> more than 250 ethnic groups, and the Kanuri, you would say, is the home and the hub of Boko Haram. Now, but they want to make so much noise about what they are doing to instill fear because, and that's the enemy. You remember that the enemy likes to make noise. The devil likes to make noise. Mm -hmm. There is this phrase I always use most of the time. <laughs> it, is, it has some African flavor to it also, that the devil is the mice talking with the microphone. See, this is, you know, one, one of the things I love about Proverbs from all over the world, I mean, I know a lot of Arabic Proverbs and yeah. others, and, and as I hear you write about these African Proverbs and such, it comes from people who just watch what happens in life very carefully. Very carefully. And they draw from it something that you might ignore otherwise, but... No, there's something here. So the devil, the devil is a is mouse the with a microphone. Microphone. And you see, that analogy is perfect. When you have a church, maybe after Sunday service, you go home and the rat goes into the church, goes to the microphone stand. As perchance the microphone is still on. It's making noise. You'll be hearing loud voice. Wow, 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 wow. You think, what's happening? You come to the church only to discover it's just this ritual rat. Yeah. And you are terrified. I want the world to know. I want even my Nigerian brothers and sisters to know wherever they are. I want those in Bonu Street State to know. I want those in Madugri to know. Those in eastern part of Cameroon to know. Every person in the world, in Africa, that we are more than conquerors in Christ. Not only that, our voice should be louder because the voice that is against us is the minority. The voice of terrorism is the minority. It is, it, is, it is the voice that we can always overcome and conquer by the power of love, by the power of the gospel of peace. Violence has its term. Violence can never thrive. 
because it's self-destructive. Terrorism is self-destructive. Now, come to think about it, Father Mitch. You call yourself Abubakar Sheku, that's the, the, the leader now, after Yusuf of Boko Haram. Or you call yourself or whatever name, whether it is ISIS or whoever. How do you think that that man, the people behind it will be trusted? Even the members they are leading astray. How do you think that the man that is killing relatives, killing children, even a child of three years, beheading a child of three years. How do you think that that man or woman can be trusted? How do you think that you, a member of the same terrorist group, will not be killed tomorrow when you are at odds with him? Look at what's happening, what happened recently last week about those Westerners who joined that war and they wanted to go back. See what they are doing to them. A terrorist can never be trusted. So to make, to build your history, build your life, build your destiny, build your future on a man that should not be trusted because he's deadly, wicked, conscienceless, conscienceless and dispassionate about him. There is no love in the heart. That man should not be trusted. And I will tell any person to please think twice. And one of the themes I talked about, think. One of the episodes, think. Let us be reasonable. Let us be rational. We are created with rationality. We are rational beings. Let's think. Let's not be boxed in to an ideology that is detrimental to the human person. Well, see, one of the things that strikes me is that the terrorists use an ideology as more important than the human beings. You, it's horrible. You put your idea ahead of humans the human that person. have an immortal soul. It's horrible. Your ideas are going to fade away, but the human soul lasts for all eternity in heaven or hell. And to put your ideas means that you'll use everybody, like you say. Uh, it's just be they all become tools for your ideas. And this destroys the, the, the terrorists' I mean, heart. It destroys everything. It destroys everything. And I, I believe that we needed to speak a word of hope. Mm -hmm. We needed to know that all hope is not lost. And Jesus is our hope. The truth is our lo hope. Love is our hope. Love endures. Remember, St. Paul would tell us, love endures. And with the tool of love, with the tool of hope, and faith in God, and faith in the future promise of redemption, I think we can stand. This is something that we also can take a look that as the terrorists try to instill fear and terror by doing horrible deeds and bragging about, about it. it in the internet. Horrible, horrible. I mean, uh, a friend of mine just told me today that he had heard me mention this in uh, a sermon. And he said, well, I'll take a look. Yeah, he just Googled. Uh, the victims of terror, he had no idea but on the, of how terrible it is. But we also can take a hope. These people have died for Jesus Christ. They are martyrs. And, you know, we, you know, though they're not officially saints, saints yeah. we can be sure that if they died for Christ, in horrible tortures, then, you know, they, they, martyrs don't even have to go to purgatory. They, are, they suffered here, and they're taken to heaven. And we can say, not only are these models of courage from that hope you're talking about, Absolutely. but they are saints for us to say, I need to, you know, my problems are nothing compared to this. 
Yes. And if they die for Jesus, how much more I must live for Jesus yes. where I have freedom. Absolutely. And, and the other perspective of the story I, I wanted to share as well, which I shared with the African audience was, sometimes we get distracted about what's going outside. Mm -hmm. And we fail to look inside what's happening with us. <laughs> One of my favorite um, authors and now a venerable, uh, venerable Bishop Sheen. Yes. I love him a lot. You know, he, he, Fulton J. Sheen. Yes, he really inspired me when I was young. Mm -hmm. And he said, if there is war outside, it is because we have no peace inside. <laughs> so the goal is not just to go proto-social alone, to talk about social evils, but to look inside individuals do we have peace what's going on inside of us what's our relationship with God what do we think about this relationship and that led me into how we are wounded even personally how we are wounded spiritually because I believe that if we are healed we can easily stand the darts of the enemy outside and we can transform the world. I believe that every person, one after the other, as individuals, are changed. I call it a new form of revolution, the changing of our mind and our mindset, the transformation of our inner being unto, unto God, so that we can reflect the true glory of God in a generation that is leading, living and leading in the shadow of unbelief and violence. You know, that I saw it as another aspect of the whole um, um, series that I didn't want to miss out because it's very as crucial as what we're doing outside. And I would add one other element because that it doesn't apply quite as strongly in Nigeria where the economy is not as advanced mm -hmm. as in Europe and the w America and mm -hmm. Australia and other places where what ha one of the dangers yeah. is that as we have become more materialistic and you mentioned unbelief we have forces in our culture that are not only materialistic for gaining possessions, but mm -hmm. they think that this is all there is. Yeah. In the face of that materialism and comfort, people become cowardly. And these terrorists arise as bullies. They recognize a materialistic culture in the West is filled with cowardice because they don't want to lose what they've got. Mm. And this is all we think there is. Mm. And so terrorists act like bullies in a schoolyard because they recognize cowardice of fat materialists. Yes. And they, you know, form this union. And we have to deal with courage as coming from our faith in Christ. That, that's a great insight. That's a great insight. And that's a contributory factor as mm -hmm. well to mm -hmm. what's happening because sometimes the logic some of them use why they think they say western education is forbidden actually that's what boko haram means western education is forbidden, forbidden. <laughs> haram <laughs> is that arabic word forbidden forbidden so um but they try to point at the negatives which are not fruit of education as such. They will point to the evil of abortion and all that um, gay marriage and uh, sexual promiscuity. They use it as an alibi, okay? But they forget that education is key to development. Look at Nigeria, for instance. Mm -hmm. Bo in Bonu State, many of the people in that ethnic group, the men don't want the women to go to school. 
But look at the south and mid middle belt of Nigeria. We have more women going to school. There is more, op we have more opportunities for people to go to school. And you see, it changes everything. Uh, education is key. Boko Haram and some of those terrorists, they don't want to go to school and they use that as an alibi. But the problem is, is going to school the problem or their own ideology as you talked about? Mm -hmm. It is just like a thief who stole and told you, well, I stole because the other day my brother stole. Doesn't make sense. Exactly. It's just brainwashing the people to think negatively. The truth is simple. We need to be informed about what's going on. We need to be informed about society. We need to be informed about life. And more importantly, we need to be informed about why we are here. Exactly. And that's what Ca Christian education offers. That's what Catholic education offers. And you, you might like to know that, and that's why I think, as you said initially, it doesn't apply more or less to Africa. In Nigeria, that part of Nigeria, we have many Catholic schools, even offering scholarships to Muslims to go to school. We have many mission schools all over. And our government schools are quite, they allow religion. Mm -hmm. You know, they allow people to pray in school. Tell them not to talk to our Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they believe that that's the only way we can change the status quo. That's the only way we can turn the clock around, turn things around for better for the society. You see, that's one of the realities that Christianity is bringing all over Africa, is that the faith does not squelch out knowledge. That's what secular people oftentimes fear, that the church suppresses knowledge. Instead, it un Oh, it opens up a flood of knowledge, and Africa is transformed they better, by it. They, they better know their history well. After yeah. all, the first university in the world started with the church. Yeah. Libraries started in the monasteries. Invention, scientific invention, creativity, all started in the monasteries and in seminaries, in schools that belonged to the church. Yeah, it was the monks who invented the scientific method. That even scientific method itself came from the church. They don't, uh, economic theory I mean, is from, you know, the, the economic theory of capitalism and such was developed by France, by Dominicans and Jesuits in the 1600s mm -hmm. in Spain. So this is, and they didn't just keep it to themselves. Knowledge grows when you give it away. And that's the way that the church wants it. Now, we have to take a break. Really? We're, yeah, it's already time for a break. Oh my but we do want you to learn more about We're Father thinking. Maurice and his work. You can go to a website, which is graziavobis.org. Now, Grazia Vobis uh, ministries. Uh, ministries about Grazia Vobis. Now, Grazia is G-R-A-T-I-A, -A, then Vobis, V-O-B-I-S, ministries. Grazia Vobis means Grace to y'all, as we would say down here in Alabama. Uh, grace to y'all, uh, ministries, graciavobis.org, uh, and you can find out more about this work there. But we're going to take a break. We want to get some of your questions and your comments, as well as those of our studio audience, so please stay with us.
Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, we have a wonderful group, mostly from Roswell, Georgia. Uh, a few folks from scattered from other places, but we would also love to have you come and join us as well. So if you can make a pilgrimage here, please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to the website ewtn.com and they will give you all kinds of information about uh, scheduling of masses, programs, uh, information on how to get up to the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament in Hansville, where the sisters are, uh, places to stay and places to eat. You know, Father Maurice, you know the good food we have around here. Uh, so we'd love to have you come and join us um, and have you oh, over here. Are you ready for some questions? Sure. Giddy up. Start off with this uh, priest over here. Father, why don't you come up to that microphone? Where are you from? I'm from Roswell, Georgia, St. Nice. Peter Chanel All Catholic right, great. Church. Wow. And your question. My question is for Father, um, what role do you see the Church of Africa playing for the global Catholic Church? I know we all have a part to play, and a lot of people see Africa as emerging. What leadership role do you see the Church of Africa playing for all of us? That's a very wonderful question, yeah. uh, Father Mitch. It's a very smart question. I, I thank you for that question. You see, the, the church in Africa is growing very fast. And Pope Francis, Pope Benedict XVI, John Paul II, before he died, they have consistently said that the hope of the church is Africa and Asia. Um, that could be translated in, or, or interpreted in many ways. And in many ways, and you see, look at between the last 20 years, we've had close to 30% growth of the church in Africa. Yeah. And that's encouraging. I'll use a little uh, more practical examples based on my recent trip to Africa to record uh, these programs. I visited five different dioceses. I visited the Archdiocese of Lagos. And I was informed that in the Archdiocese of Lagos, where um, Adewale Martins, Archbishop Adewale Martins is the Archbishop, they have more than five million Catholics in that Archdiocese alone. And that's Lagos. And they are building a big university, Catholic university, in the Archdiocese of Lagos to equip the people. That's a pointer to something. And from there, I went to the Archdiocese of Owere. The Archdiocese of Owere is located in Imo State, and the Diocese of Olu also in Imo State. We saw thousands and thousands of people, uh, testimonies of growth from the Archbishop of Owere, Archbishop Obina, the same story from the Bishop of Olu, Bishop Augustine Okwama, the same story of growth and hope. Mm -hmm. From there, we went to Cameroon, went to the Archdiocese of Bamenda, and we were with the Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Bamenda, Bishop Cornelius, Archbishop Cornelius Esua. And they have a Catholic university right there, close to that Archdiocese. And they testify that more and more people are baptized more and more people are welcome to the church. And you see the hope. And people are proud of their faith. From there, we went to the Diocese of Boya. The same story. During the interaction with Bishop Bushu, Bushu, Bushu Emmanuel of Boya, he explained how the church has so much grown. The same story is everywhere in Africa, from east to north to west to middle Africa, every part of Africa. And it shows that the church is alive in spite of what's going on. Back to the question. The, I think the role the church in Africa will play is to show how they, they love the faith, how they are expressive of their faith. They are not intimidated by anything. Poverty, 
violence, terrorism, economics, on the development. Because they know they have their wealth as well. Spirituality is, is great wealth. It's not all about material possession. They can play a role, a spiritual role of encouraging the people who are losing faith in God. That could be a way to begin. About all the types of leadership, economic leadership, we are not there yet. And that's not the goal now. But there is one uh, uh, inside the church. We've already seen um, you know, great men like Cardinal Orinzi come, you know, he's also from Nigeria. From Nigeria, from uh, Onicha at that is That's where actually I was born. And he was a, a convert as a small child. Mm -hmm. He wasn't born a Catholic. But, you know, th the faith raised, uh, and this is what it does for all the peoples to whom it goes, the faith raises up the intellect along with faith. And with his great gifts, he served in the, the, the curia uh, of the Pope in Rome. And there are Africans studying all over the world as a, a new source of theologians who really do the theology out of faith and not out of academic interest. And that they, they combine that. That's one of the areas where I see the intellectual growth of the community, uh, communities in Africa bringing great gifts to the rest of the church, plus missionaries. Yes, you are correct. And that's part of what you said about my book, mm -hmm. you know, that we have our story to tell as well. Mm -hmm. And that story can be very, very informative for the church elsewhere. Exactly. So. Yes, so there's a lot of, lot of great gifts. We have uh, Tom on the line. Hello, Tom. Tom, are you there? Hello. Hi. Where are you from? I'm from uh, I'm from uh, uh, Florida, Father. Okay. And your question? My question is, uh, I want to make a comment to Father Maurice. Sure. I've been in, uh, I'm a secular Franciscan, and a few years ago I was in Africa. I was in uh, uh, Liberia, and I was in Mombasa. Mombasa. And I attended mass at the cathedral, quite a, uh, quite a few masses there. And the faith of the people was unbelievable. I mean, that's something that is something I will never forget. And God bless you, and God bless Father Maurice. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. See, that's, <laughs> that's one of the other things. It's faith. In the face of this, you know, some outbreaks of persecution and terrorism. Yeah. But that doesn't squelch the faith. Actually, does it? it increases the faith. I've always said it. Um, persecution helps the church. It brings out the best in us. And that's what we see in the church in Africa. And this is a, a faith with joy. They are not sad about their faith. They are not depressed. Africans don't take an eye depressant because they don't need it. <laughs> yeah, for sure, they don't need it because that, the faith, affords them. That's the community of faith affords them. When you come to a typical church in Afri Africa, people are happy to come to church. They are very exuberant. As a matter of fact, I remember one priest telling me that if you don't have the mask go for at least two or three hours, then they're unhappy. Yeah, and actually, I mean, if you if you go five minutes over at a mass in America, hey, I got a football game to go to, <laughs> and the next group is coming into the parking lot. We have a traffic jam in Africa. Is how many people walk or ride a bicycle for hours? So they're gonna they want to be there for hours. I, I, and when they come to church. They relax. They believe that this is the house of God. Remember the book of Psalms. I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go to the house of the Lord. They are happy going to the house of the Lord and they re relax. Those who traveled with me from here in the United States, they saw it 
they saw the joy. They saw the, the, the Sunday Mass relax and the homily. The priest, given a homily in a typical parish of, uh, in Africa, given a homily of five minutes on a Sunday or ten minutes, <laughs> do you know what the people will think? They will think... <laughs> He's not praying. He's not a good <laughs> priest. He's not, he doesn't know, he doesn't know what to say, or maybe he didn't prepare his homily. <laughs> they want to hear you talk about the Word of God. They want to see you quote the Bible, quote the Catechism if you can. They want to see that. It's part of what, who they are. Yeah, it's not just him talking about his feelings about something. No, no, he no, no. He better have it, the faith. Tell us the faith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's get another question here from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Johns Creek, Georgia. Good, good to have you here. Welcome in your question. My name is Dennis Murray, and uh, I've got to first thank you for your efforts. I can see how your efforts in Nigeria dovetails exactly with what President Obama announced recently war on ISIS. And I think um, we need to see more and more of this perpetuate across the world. So my question to you is, how can Christians across the world, especially the United States, help you in making sure that you're successful in your movement and to take your efforts across the globe? Because I think a threat for, to humanity anywhere is a threat to humanity everywhere. You're right. Who does not like that kind of question? Yeah. yeah. It's a very wonderful question. I, you say, spread the word. Tell it to the mountains. Speak it to friends. Tell them that, that there is hope. Secondly, any organization that you think can enhance the story, this positive story of life, this cultural enrichment, encourage that organization. The Catholic bishops of the United States are doing so much. The Catholic bishops in most countries of Africa are also doing a lot of that cultural exchange. And I have an organization as well, Grazia Vobis. Father knows a lot of languages, and that's why he could say exactly what it meant. It means grace to you. Grazia Vobis ministry's goal is to further that vision of enrichment cultural enrichment between Africa and the West. True programming, true charity apostolate. Uh, but there are so many other organizations who do similar things, but I think we can tell the story, we can speak it and spread the word. By so doing, I think we may do a lot. But if you want more concrete examples, well, Gracia Vobis is there to further that example. And, and I think, you know, partly in response to his question, because, uh, you know, our guest lives in Georgia, and so, you know, what we have to do is do this kind of evangelizing More. with that, by being so centered in Christ that the joy he gives us comes out and it, I mean, this is what you see in Africa. The faith can't just stay inside a lantern that's called, it's open, it's a light that goes out to give this radiance of joy. And okay. in the face of our culture in America, trying to shut all the lights of faith. Mm. You know, uh, you've been in America long enough to know um, uh, 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 just to, today it was on the news, a, a young uh, woman was celebrating the fact that she wants to wait until marriage before Amen. she gives herself to a man. Amen to that. And she, uh, and she says, virginity rocks. She was forbidden to talk, to say that. They can say all kinds of nasty things about all the sexual things you can do in class, but that she could promote virginity. Her, she had to turn her, sh change her shirt to another shirt that they gave her at the school. Hmm. Now, this That's attempt to stifle what a young girl wanted to express, of, the joy of obeying Christ. Hmm. We have to then say, they can try to stifle us, 
but we're not going to be stifled. Yeah, man, the joy. This, Remember this Pope key. Francis, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. I have a, a story that happened while I was in Cleveland, while I was in the graduate school in John Carroll University yes. in Cleveland, between a classmate of mine, uh, uh, an American, she asked me in class one day, she said, she's not a Catholic, but she said, Maurice, can you tell me how come you are very happy about your faith and you are willing to share it anytime somebody asks you? I want to have that kind of joy. You know, I want to have it. Teach me that I say, well, you don't teach it, people. It's not taught. It's lived. <laughs> you know, the joy of the gospel can impact lives, as you said. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Let's get to another caller. Hello, John. Hello, Father Mitch. Hello. Well, I know where he's from, Ohio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and, uh, John, what is your question? Uh, my question would be for Father Maurice, uh, He's really on fire, and I hear a lot of reports where the people really are on fire for God. It's not a lukewarm thing. It's a very alive thing. And I was wondering if Father Maurice, with the wisdom he's learned in a country that can be torn by so many different things, what would his advice be to we Catholic Christians where, this isn't very Catholic, but I'll say it, soul winners, and what could he advise us? And thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you. What I would advise is take your faith seriously. Once you take your faith seriously, you build on the principles of love and hope. So the three cardinal virtues, key, faith, hope, and love, if we take it seriously and be agents of those virtues ourselves, it's, it's not it's not just a kind of uh, um, library shelf attitude where you just, I go to Mass on Sunday and I'm, I'm back and that's it. It does not reflect in my day-to-day -day life and activity. Show, be happy about your faith. People like to see you happy. They like to see you positive, uh, positive about what you do. I have observed that more often than not, Many people in the West tend to be always on the defense of their faith. They are always defending, defending, defending. That's because we have a lot of people offending, offending, <laughs> offending. <laughs> so how about we, we turn the tide and be very positive about it, right. expressive about it. I'm not saying you violate your laws. Who am I to say that? but be positive. Who does not like joy? Who does not like true love? Who does not like I faith? I know, I know. <laughs> Atheists don't like that stuff. Well, I mean, have, you ever, have you ever seen a funny atheist? I have seen Dawkins. They, they, can, yeah, I've they, seen they can be cynical. Maya, I've seen the, some of them. Right, but do you see them as funny? Cynical, yes. Sarcastic, yes. But sarcasm is simply the anger of the weak. And they never express joy. They have none. They have none. And their material success is partly what makes them cowards. Hmm. This is something that, and we get weakened if we d expect material success to give us joy. Not very. It's a good thing. It's never. not bad, but it's not going to give you joy. Never, never. Isn't this principle very worth considering here? We know in basic economics and leadership, when there is need, if you supply that need, you will change the world. The world today is in need of love. The world today is in need of joy of the spirit.
it's we are in need of, of healing and, and forgiveness. forgiveness. Yep. So can we offer that? One of the chapters in this book is forgiveness. One of the episodes in the series is forgiveness. How can we offer that to a bitter world? How can we offer that to a hateful people? That's the value we have, which atheism does not have. The atheists can try to understand justice. But, but they not never, mercy. Exactly. Never. They don't know how to integrate mercy, forgiveness, or love with justice. It's a mystery, to be sure. And we must struggle to integrate both. Yeah. But they either ignore all justice and just let go of everything, or they became, become all justice and no mercy. No mercy. Watch how they act. When somebody they don't like does something wrong, watch how the news stories just are merciless no mercy. to the people they don't like and th th they become incapable of it. Yeah, I, I, and another insight to that, and I find it also fascinating. You know St. Augustine? I was reading a line about him. He said, many people in the world, unbelievers can claim even to love, in parentheses, they can claim to have faith, in parentheses. But one thing that Christians have, they don't have, is forgiveness and mercy. <laughs> Let's take another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Santa Cruz, California, Father. Great to have you. It's a beautiful area. It is. And your question? I, uh, Father Maurice. Um, how widespread is devotion to Our Lady under the title of Our Lady of Cabejo uh, throughout Africa? Um, do you think devotion to her will spread uh, throughout the United States as devotion to Our Lady under the title of Our Lady of Guadalupe has uh, spread? And do you think that there is some message uh, for us an early warning like there might have been in Rwanda uh, from Our Lady of Cabejo today. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, in my book I referred to Our Lady of, of Cabejo and I referenced the book um, Left to Tell by Immaculate, oh, yes. who was one of the um, people that brought the story to um, more publicity we have now. Um, in Rwanda, the story of Our Lady of Kibeho is a remarkable story. And I think the Vatican is giving more and more um, attention to it. Recently, during the visit of the Wandan bishops to uh, mark the, the anniversary of the, I think the 20th anniversary of the, uh, of the Wanda genocide, genocide mm -hmm. um, Pope Francis made reference to that devotion. In the meantime, it's not been officially you know, say that um, uh, approved, uh, approved like, like Fatima, like Fatima. Right. but it is in the, in the making, mm -hmm. and we are positive it will. It is spreading in most parts of Africa, and I think it's already spreading here in the U.S. because I visit parishes and I see people who talk about it. I believe that the message of Our Lady else everywhere is the same. Pray, pray, fast, pray for the end of evil in the world. Yeah. And it, that's the central message of, of uh, Our Lady of Kibeho, even though it was more particular to Rwanda. So we pray and uh, hoping that it's gonna be okay. I want to let people know, because we're running out, of, we've run out of time, mm -hmm. uh, going very quickly. But uh, we want you to watch Father's series, Word for a Wounded World. Uh, it'll be on EWTN. Pick up Father Maurice's book and the DVD of the series at EWTN's Religious Catalog, uh, which you uh, can go to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com. And Father, would you join me in giving a blessing? Of course. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways by His peace. Bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, and it's really great to have Father come here from his parish in California and also be able to do this series and uh, 
all the other great work he's doing, but we can present it to you only because you make it possible. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll be able to pay our bills because this network is brought to you by you. Thank you.